If you're just joining, you're listening to a ProPublica Roundtable on inflation. My name is Connor Goodwin, and I'm an event associate with ProPublica. For those new to us, ProPublica is a nonprofit newsroom dedicated to investigative journalism. Inflation is the top concern for most Americans today. And at this event, we will unpack the current economic situation, examine the root causes of inflation, assess the Federal Reserve's response to price increases, and forecast possible outcomes for the economy. We'll also answer your questions. To ask a question at any point, click the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen and type it there. Also, you can enable subtitles by clicking on the closed captioning icon at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And now, allow me to introduce our speakers. Claudia Somm is a well-known, highly regarded Washington-based expert on monetary and fiscal policy and forecasting. She has several years of experience advising decision makers at the Federal Reserve, White House, and Congress. Rakeen Maboud is the Chief Economist and Managing Director of Policy and Research at the Groundwork Collaborative. Michael Graybell writes about economic issues, labor, and trade for ProPublica. His most recent story focused on hidden fees in the ocean shipping industry, and he's the author of a book on President Obama's economic recovery, economic recovery efforts after the 2007 recession. And our moderator today is Nora Ali. Nora is the CEO and co-founder of an upcoming media venture and host of the Business Casual podcast from Morning Brew. I'll let Nora take it from here. All right. Thank you, Connor. And thanks, everyone, for attending. I'm so excited to be joined by this panel of experts. I think this is the first time in my recent memory that everyone's talking about inflation, not just economists. In fact, I was listening to a dating podcast episode and the title of the episode was, is it inflation or is he just not that into me? So we're all talking about it. So I'm excited to learn more about what's actually causing inflation right now. So Claudia, we'll start with you. This is the hotly debated topic. Is it fiscal policy, monetary policy, the war in Ukraine, the pandemic, greedy corporations, probably some combination of all of these things, but from your expert economist perspective, what factors are considered to be the main driving forces behind inflation generally, and who is getting hit the hardest right now? Right, so there are many causes, right? We have a really complicated situation, and that obviously is going to be a complicated set of factors. All that said, the root of all evil with inflation and a lot of the other disruptions that we have lived through in the past two and a half years goes back to COVID, right? And so I know there's a lot of focus on inflation, but rewind a year ago and we had millions of people without jobs. That was also related to COVID. The, the event, we shut down a $25 trillion economy in March of 2020 to keep people safe. I'm not disputing that the global economy largely shut down. Just think of when you, it's a lot easier to shut something down, like your computer. It's a lot harder to get it booted up. Like it takes more time, particularly if it's an old computer that you haven't paid any attention to like actually investing money in. So what we have lived through is a very messy reopening. And the where we're at right now is with inflation. Now there's a lot of other contributors things, you know, putting, pumping extra money into the economy through the rescue plan, I mean, which frankly is a good thing people had money, uh, you know, the um, labor market coming back so strong actually also put a lot of demand in. That's another tricky one. It has a lot of good, but it did contribute to inflation. And then uh, Vladimir Putin tried really hard and maybe did take the front runner for the root of all evil in inflation this year. And that is absolutely a big piece of the run up in gas prices. Since March, when we hit uh, $5 recently, that was a $1.50 increase in gas prices. So there's a lot of problems. There's no one single bullet and different economists, experts would rank them differently. But at the end of the day, we would not be in this mess if a global pandemic had not come down upon us. That makes sense, Claudia. Uh, I do want to focus in on a couple of the factors that you mentioned and turn it over to Rakeen on this. Rakeen, to what extent do you think things like increasing worker wages or these investments, this pumping of extra money that Claudia mentioned, like the American Rescue Plan, to what extent do you think those are at the root of our current inflation problem? <laughs> 
Yeah, my short answer is no. Um, I mean, I think we really ought to build a system and have a system where we can deal with fluctuations in demand, right? That we can, a system that can handle a shock, whether that's a global pandemic or increases and decreases in demand. And, you know, the, the sort of short answer on worker wages and $1,200 stimulus checks is that they're not the main drivers of, of inflation right now. You know, policies like the ARP were essential lifelines for millions of people around the country. And it's exactly the reason why we're actually in the midst of a historic recovery of a strong, resilient economy, right? So giving people uh, the resources to keep their lights on, to put food on the table, to take care of their children, that's buoyed our economy in during a period of immense crisis, right? And we know what the alternative is because we saw it in the wake of the Great Recession. We could have had a jobless recovery with sluggish growth, um, and we are on, the, on, a, on a better path precisely because we have centered people on these investments. Um, and, you know, I think it's also important to note, I think workers are often scapegoated in this inflation conversation. But inflation, uh, workers have been facing rock bottom wages for decades, right? I mean, worker wages are, are abysmal in this country. And the secular decline in unionization has harmed workers' access to economic mobility for a really, really long time. So the fact that we're seeing rising wages from a very, very low baseline in the midst of a crisis is actually an incredible testament to the importance of investments like those in the ARP. Um, and so the real culprits, in my view, really take advantage of many of the factors that Claudia laid out at the top of this conversation. Um, and, you know, I want to name specifically the, the culprit that um, Grammar Collaborative has really focused on, which is mega corporations who were really perfectly positioned by virtue of their market power to take advantage of this period of economic shocks. You know, so my team at Groundwork has combed through hundreds of earnings calls, um, which are the calls where CEOs tell their investors kind of what the past quarter's performance was like and what the future um, outlook is. And in sector after sector and company after company, what we see is CEOs are saying the quiet part out loud. They are celebrating their ability to raise prices to provide, I mean, they're currently, I mean, we're seeing 70 year record highs in um, corporate profit margins provide huge payouts to their shareholders. It's not wage increases that are holding them back. And they're saying like, look, inflation is giving us cover to do this, to sort of gild the little a little bit, right? To go back in for another spoonful. And the last thing I'll say is it's not just the earnings calls, which I think are a really rich data set, um, but quantitative data also backs this up. So there's recent research from the Economic Policy Institute that found that as of Q1 of 2022, corporate profits are a much, much bigger chunk of the recent rise in prices than wages um, or input costs, right? So about 54% of the price increases are due to corporate profits. Um, input costs comprise about 38% and wages comprise less than 8%. So, you know, I, this is a complicated story, but workers are certainly not to blame and neither are the down payment and investments that we started to make in the ARP, which were critically important to getting us to where we are today. That's really interesting where, like you said, inflation is a cover where corporations can say, oh, we're raising prices because of inflation, but they're raising it to a higher extent than, than even where inflation is. So speaking of people taking advantage, Michael, you had this incredible investigative report on ProPublica called the hidden fees making your bananas and everything else cost more, where ocean carriers might actually be taking advantage of the situation. So what were your findings in terms of inflation with these ocean carriers? Yeah, I, um, so I took a look at this a slice of this problem, which is the supply chain. And there's a lot of people have in, in the Q&A that we asked beforehand, asked sort of what is the breakdown of what, what is causing it? And there are different studies. There's one from the Federal Reserve Bank in San Francisco that estimated that supply problems were, were currently half of the problems that we were seeing versus you know, a third being demand. And so, but you know, like Claudia said, this all kind of started with, um, with COVID uh, and the problems we had uh, both in the increased demand that people had, uh, that people had from the, the savings from, the, from shifting the spending from services to, to goods and, and you know couches and things to to make living staying at home more pleasant, um, and at the same time you know the increase in money in both uh, the Trump administration and the Biden administration's uh, stimulus checks that kicking in, um, but at the same time we also had these dramatic supply shocks where um, places were shut down, uh, people couldn't come to work because they were quarantined, and that really kind of gummed up the works a bit. And we haven't, 
even though we've seen some moderation with the supply chain uh, since, since the holiday season, it really hasn't, we haven't really gotten a break because immediately after the holiday season, we had the war in Ukraine uh, that, that caused problems with energy and gas, sorry, energy and food prices. And um, right after that, we had the shutdowns in Shanghai, which, which created a different problem for the supply chain. Um, so the Biden administration has really focused a lot on um, some of the, the basic numbers that um, the cost to ship a container from Asia to the West Coast went from two, less than $2,000 before the pandemic to $20,000 in September of last year. Uh, and you know that's a, a huge increase in, in what we pay um, and gets added onto the price of our products. Um, and the ocean shipping industry currently in recent months has been experiencing a 57% profit margin, which is much higher than they've ever experienced before. Um, and so the, the, the slice of this I looked at were these hidden fees that are known as detention and demurrage. And it sounds really complicated. These are things that even the cor people in corporate boardrooms hadn't heard of until late last year, but they started significantly impacting the prices that it costs to bring goods in. And what these essentially are, they're late fees. And, and normal, these are essentially late fees. And in normal times, they make a lot of sense. Importers who don't pick up their stuff on time get charged demurrage for storage of marine terminals. Truckers who don't return an empty container on time pay late fees, and that's known as detention. And the purpose of the penalties is to, is to incentivize the various players in the supply chain to keep the goods flowing. Um, the only problem is with the, with the congestion that we were seeing, there was no amount of fine or fee that was going to get um, these containers back to the ports or get picked up on time. And uh, ocean carriers decided that they were gonna, even though they were making it extremely difficult to return these containers or to, or to allow companies to pick up the containers, they were gonna charge late fees anyway. Uh, and so these things added up to where uh, a container that might have cost, you know, um, six thousand dollars or you know a few thousand dollars is now costing like forty to sixty thousand dollars per you know to, to bring something over. And the example I used was you know this the shipment of six hundred thousand pounds of bananas, um, which normally cost sixty cents per pound. And when the proposed fee was added in. It would have added another 30 cents on top of that, just that detention to merge fee alone, not including the increased cost of bringing it over from Central America, not including the cost of trucking, not including any sort of profit. This detention to merge fee was adding up to that much, half of the cost of what bananas were selling for in the grocery store. And I do want to sort of think about this larger idea of why does the the cause of inflation actually matter to us and what the scale of the problem is. So Michael, very quickly as a follow-up, you wrote that 90% of the stuff Americans buy from overseas arrives by ship and nearly all of it is carried by a number of ocean carriers, a small number of ocean carriers that work together in three alliances that dominate the trade. Can you just contextualize the scale at which this impacts consumers at the end of the day? Yeah, just like you said, 90% of the stuff we buy from overseas and we buy a lot of stuff from overseas. Um, and those, you know, so, so this, be, this in the past, right, this was a invisible cost to us that we didn't have to pay attention to because it was so cheap. It, the, the, the fact that it cost less than $2,000 to move something, a container full of 40,000 pounds of goods from Asia to the US costs so little is what makes it possible for us to move manufacturing to all those other countries and to, to, to to have extremely low prices. Those come with other costs on the back end uh, that, that we don't realize. Um, but in this, you know, in this situation, when there was a problem where the fees went from $2,000 to $20,000, where detention and murder merge fees that nobody really ever paid attention to were suddenly eight to $20,000, all of a sudden our prices for everything that we bought was going up. Mm -hmm. So with corporations and these carriers, taking advantage of the situation now, it, it you know reminds me of what Claudia had said is the root of all evil is COVID, but it's not like our supply chains were built during COVID. Some of these issues likely existed pre-pandemic. So Rakeen, what does this high inflation now tell us about the problems perhaps in our supply chain and the economy even before the pandemic? Yeah, and that's a really important question. I think Michael really teed it up beautifully. You know, 
inflation today is a symptom. It's not necessarily the disease, right? And um, as, as Michael was just referring to, companies have are taking advantage of this moment to add on extra fees or raise their prices. Um, and they're doing that precisely because, you know, they had a deal with the American consumer. The deal was, we're going to build a supply chain that is extremely brittle, that's a just-in-time supply chain, where we're going to cut away every single fail-safe that exists in the system in order for us to maximize short-term profits. What you get as a consumer is cheap goods and goods delivered on time, right? But as soon as there's any shock to that system, whether that's a pandemic, whether that's a shift in demand, um, whether that's a factory on the other side of the world shutting down because of a COVID outbreak, that deal breaks apart. And that's exactly what we saw. I mean, to Claudia's point, the pandemic was really a catalyst um, that exposed a lot of what had been gone you know, wrong in the way that we built this system, a really fragile system in the first place. And when I say we, what I really mean is the way mega corporations had built the system that, that benefited themselves, right? And, um, you know, I often talk about how in this moment, what we have is a, is a, is a perfect confluence of means, motive, and opportunity. Um, you know, these big companies, these, you know, to, to the ocean shipping um, example, three alliances that, that dominate the ocean shipping industry, like by far, um, have market power, right? They had market power to build a system that worked for them. They have market power to exercise, um, you know, to jack up prices above what their input costs would justify. We've always seen that companies have had a profit motive. That's not new. Um, no one's saying that's new, but that is interacting in an important way with that means. And they have opportunity now, right? They have the cover of inflation. Consumers don't know how much of the increase of the prices that they're seeing is because of the increase of input costs versus, you know, gilding that lily a little bit. And I think the ocean shipping example is just such a good one because it shows how um, endemic uh, concentration and consolidation has made our economy ripe for profiteering. Um, you know, with these three big alliances, it's not an accident. And we, it's a set of policy choices that we made in the 1980s and 1990s to deregulate the industry uh, and allow for this um, oligopoly of um, ocean carriers to build power and consolidate. And um, at the end of the day, what it means is that these companies can keep costs low for themselves and reap profits without being any with any risk of being undercut at competition, and it comes at the expense of stability and reliability for consumers. Um, and so, you know, in Q1, and this, these are points I'm just reiter reiterating what Michael already said, but you know, it, the result is that in Q1 of 2022, the global shipping oligopoly earned a record-breaking $59.3 billion in profits, and they're expected to make even four times that this year. I mean, that's a ridiculous amount of profits, and a significant share of that is just them, you know, jacking up prices. You know, they've increased freight shipping rates from the U.S. to Asia by over a thousand percent over the course of the pandemic. That is not a normal thing. That's not market forces at work. That's simply these big companies exercising their market power to take advantage of the situation. I want to stay on that for a second, Rakeen, because we've seen some of the shortcomings when it comes to regulation around mega corporations. Very publicly, we've seen hearings for tech companies, for example, where lawmakers might not actually know what the right regulation is to prevent these oligopolies or monopoly situations. So whose responsibility is it to hold these mega corporations accountable such that they don't charge consumers more than they have to? Yeah, I mean, there are a range of tools in our toolbox, right, that we should be using to address this issue. Um, you know, 34, 35 states, I believe, have um, price gouging statutes. We could have a federal price gouging statute. We could start um, taxing corporations better. That might mean a windfall profits tax. It could also just mean more aggressive corporate taxation. Um, we could empower the DOJ and the FTC, two um, important bodies with regulatory power and enforcement power, to actually enforce um, and regulate these big companies. So we don't, it's not that we have a dearth of solutions at our disposal, it's that we're not using them, right? And I think that's, that at the end of the day is what I think we're going to get to a little bit later in, in how do we talk about, how do we actually address this, the root issue causes of this problem today? Um, and we're, the sort of policy discourse is focusing on a very specific blunt tool that addresses demand, but given the supply side and supply chain issues that are driving many of these high prices, I think we really need to think more creatively um, about the, the types of policy changes that we need to make to address this issue. Yeah, you're right. We will get to more solutions in a few minutes. But Claudia, I did want to turn to one question that we got that's related in the Q&A, because um, Rakeen and Michael were talking about some of the issues in the supply chain 
ecosystem that were an issue before the pandemic. So the question from Leslie here is, is there anything that could have been done to limit the severity of inflation at the outset of the pandemic? Uh, uh, well, I guess I'll answer that. One thing I wanted to add on to when we're talking about these supply chains is right now, this is a big problem for a lot of reasons that were just discussed. But since the 1990s, durable goods, many which have come through these supply chains produced in Asia and other parts, they have fallen in a like quality adjusted way. So we have enjoyed years and years from this system. Now I'm not saying that means the system is good and we should like keep going, but I, we need to like step back and understand. I think for me, one of the painful things of this crisis, there are many, um, but with thinking about inflation is understanding exactly how we had gotten all those really low prices, right? Like we have gotten these low prices on the backs of workers in Asia, people who get very low pay in the United States, you know, these systems that are just put together with shoestring and bubble gum, right? Like, so I think this is one where we do have to be honest about, like fixing these systems may come with a cost, but a but you but a benefit will be a more resilient and more equitable system. But I think this is you know kind of opening up that discussion. Um, in terms of okay, so you know we talked a lot about this you know supply chains and the government and whatever businesses contributed a lot to this problem early on in the in the pandemic, and it's not blaming them necessarily. Is they like many of the rest of us had really no idea what was going to happen next, right? So in when COVID started, the economy shut down, demand disappeared, a lot of businesses had, like weren't ordering goods, like they weren't, ex they weren't expecting consumers to come back as quickly. It turned out that consumers came back a lot more quickly than did the goods and, you know, the same with the workers. And so there were mistakes made mistakes. I mean, there were misjudgments that caused a lot of the tension because we really did have this big shift in demand from services to goods. And, you know, we'd waited on things. And so then it all came at once. It really did put a lot of pressure on the system. And that, you know, some of it was, you know, honest mistakes, and some were probably uh, more using the crisis to do things that were less, um, fair to consumers and the rest of us. But I think the problem with the crisis has been that none of us have had a crystal ball, the best efforts of policymakers, businesses, people <laughs> to try and figure out what comes next. Like this was just so far out of the playbook. And, and so that meant it was, it was a really big problem that we had so many fragile systems. I mean, supply chains are just the start of the list, right? COVID really preyed on a lot of the structural problems that we had. So it was a little bit of like dominoes continuing to fall. So, um, oh, I would, the one thing we could have done early in the pandemic is really get on COVID in terms of vaccinations and the public health, like politicizing that came with a lot of costs, human costs, but mm -hmm. also it, it's made the disruptions harder. Absolutely. Claudia, sticking with you, I want to talk about oil now. So the White House has pointed the finger at oil companies for high profits as you know, part of this conversation we're having around mega corporations. But the U.S. oil industry has responded that they don't actually have the ability to increase drilling or even refinery capacity. They're doing everything they can or so they say. How true is that? And do you think there is anything the oil industry can do? Well, I think there's I think there is a lot of truth to what they're saying, though, you know, with the caveats. One thing to remember is in 2020, oil prices like in Mark went like to zero. And in some cases in like the futures markets to negative. Now we had really cheap gas in 2020. A lot of people weren't driving to work. We were panicked about other things, but uh, the administration, the Trump administration did not step in. I mean, and this was widespread. I'm not, you know, pointing fingers here. There were other crises, but like nobody, when gas is really cheap and we do have it cycle, like every five or six years, we've had these kind of cycles. Nobody steps in and says, oh, it's really low. We need to like save these companies. And, and it got low enough. Again, the oil prices were extremely low. Demand for gas for the first time in forever really dropped off. There were companies, particularly refineries you hear of that were really, um, old and had not been invested in, they just they just shut down. 
right? Or, you know, it just, and so that means that, again, them restarting is very difficult. I know there's been a lot of discussion about the exceptional profits that oil and gas is making this year. But again, they've had this like feast and famine, no shareholder, and the shareholder economy is what we got, you got to deal with this. But no shareholder is going to say, well, just because this year is profitable, let's go and, you know, invest and drill, because next year might like these prices are, are probably temporarily high. And then, you know, there's not necessarily much of a future in oil and gas. So this is one where, to, I mean, and gas prices doubled since the start of in the past, since the beginning of COVID, gas prices have doubled. That is an incredible hardship for families. And, but at the end of the day, you get gas prices down when you get oil prices down. And that's, you either raise supply or you reduce demand. And um, doing uh, taxes on exceptional profits right now, that can be one way to, um, you know, take some of that money and redistribute it to, to people who are paying those high prices. But that still does not fix this problem with energy. And it will come again, maybe not this severely, but like we, we've had these cycles. Yeah, if I could just jump in here and add something to what Claudia was saying. I mean, I think that's exactly right. There's incredible volatility in the global oil market um, and therefore what people experience when they try to drive their kids to work. Um, and the only way out of that is to detach, like, detach ourselves from, from being tethered to the global oil market, right? So, you know, to the question that the audience member had about what could we have done before the pandemic? I mean, my answer to that is like, we should have invested. We should have invested in better systems to, to begin with. And I think this is another case where investing in clean, green energy is the best way to get ourselves um, away from that boom and bust cycle of you know, commodity markets, to, to have a better and healthier planet and to have more stable prices. Um, so I just wanted to throw that out there too, because I think often these conversations get very stuck in the here and now. And as we've been talking about, these are long running, deep seated, deep rooted problems that we have to think really big about, right? And big investments are one really, really critical tool that we have um, to build a system that is resilient and that does function and, and protects us from these types of shocks in the future. To your point, Rakeen, there's this, and, and to your point, Claudia, there's this portfolio of actions that should be taken, can be taken, could have been taken. But Michael, going back to you know some of these potential solutions and the question I asked Rakeen around regulation and the authorities, what actions do you think regulatory authorities should take at this time, um, given that it's it already feels like it's a little bit too late in some cases, but what do you think should be the immediate actions right now from those regulators? Yeah, you're right. There's very little that you can do on the on the short term from a regulatory standpoint. Um, even if they were to crack down on every monopoly, it would it would take a, a long time, and these would be tough legal cases. Um, in in terms of ocean shipping, uh, there has been some action from the Federal Maritime Commission trying to send a signal that uh, charging fees that serve no purpose um, is, shouldn't be allowed. And, uh, you know, so they did propose, they tried to propose a $16 million fine on, on one ocean carrier named Hapag Lloyd. Um, and ultimately the case was set up for $2 million. Seems like a lot, but when you actually break it down, it was about the profits that Hapag had made in 98 minutes last year. Um, so, so not quite, a, 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 you know, maybe not quite a signal, as, as large a signal as could be needed, we'll have to see. I did want to go back to so something that Claudia had, had talked about and putting what we're seeing with inflation into context. Uh, it's very easy to be upset about increased prices, but we do have to ask the question about you know, whether we're seeing is inflation or a correction of artificially low prices that we've been used to paying. And I think um, you know, the, the example that I've been using for this is you know, in recent weeks, the business community has been up in arms about a law called the Weaker Forced Labor Prevention Act which was what Congress passed to um, sort of take action on the mass movement and detention of, of Uyghurs uh, to go to, 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 to work in re-education camps. And you know, that may raise prices. They try to refigure out the supply chain and ensure that nothing is coming from this region. But nobody expected the stuff that we were buying before this was made with forced labor. Um, and that, that's not the, that shouldn't be the norm, right? Um, and if retailers had been required to put a big sign on the products they were selling saying made, this may have been made with forced labor, 
like a cigarette package, people wouldn't have bought them. Um, so the real price shouldn't be the one that that is made with oppression. That's not the normal fr free labor market that that we expect when we talk about free markets. And in the same case with oil prices, there's been a number of studies over the years that have estimated that the real price of a gallon of gas is multiple times what we pay at the pump when you factor in cost of wars and climate change. That's not something that we see at the at, at when we pay for gas usually. Um, so I think it's a, it is an important perspective to keep in mind when we have this discussion about what for right now is a short-term inflation six months period, six months to a year period. Yeah, that, that's really important context. Thank you, Michael. So shockingly, we haven't even really talked about the Fed yet. So let's turn to that. Um, obviously, Jerome Powell and the Federal Reserve have a host of tools that they used during the pandemic that contributed to this level of inflation that we're at now. But I guess, Rakeen, starting with you, what is the most appropriate thing for the Fed to use right now, the most appropriate tools right now to try to combat inflation? I'm going to be contrarian and say, I don't think the Fed is the solution here. Um, so the Fed is pretty aggressively raising interest rates and signaling additional rate hikes. Um, and there's a real risk that the Fed could um, could act too aggressively. I mean, I think that's that's something that we're really keeping an eye on. And we hear this from economists like Larry Summers, right, who have said, who has been very public about the fact that we need to aggressively raise rates, according to him, not to me, um, to crush wage growth and raise unemployment rate aggressively to tamp down inflation. But this remedy for inflation is just worse than a disease, right? Artificially creating a recession will put millions of people out of work, especially black and brown workers, um, black workers, even in a so-called good healthy labor market face double the unemployment rate of white workers. Like imagine what that looks like when you are you're forcing a country into a recession. Um, and I think, you know, the idea that the Fed is the sort of savior, <laughs> the messiah for, for inflation reflects a fundamental misunderstanding of why we have rising price, prices in the first place. The, the primary issue here is not demand, right? We should, we should have a system that can handle demand. It's broken supply chains, it's unbridled corporate, corporate power, it's pandemic profiteering. And so constraining demand by making people poorer, which is exactly what raising interest rates will do, is flawed and dangerous and will, you know, really puts, puts at risk the health of our economy both now, but also in the long term. So, you know, I would say that the only thing worse than high inflation is high inflation and high unemployment. Um, and if you want to raise rates aggressively or put this problem entirely in the hands of the Fed, that's, that's actually where I think we're going to end up. Adia, do you agree that we don't need an artificial or forced recession? We don't need to make people poor. Do you agree with uh, what Rakeen said? Yeah, we don't need a recession. The Federal Reserve would agree with that. Right, like this is not, they are not trying to cause a recession. They're trying to get inflation down. They are very clear they're going to keep going until they get inflation down. Um, what frustrates me to no end are the comments from the administration and from Congress that the Fed's got this, right? It's kind of, let's, let's pass the football and you're gonna take care of inflation. And frankly, that is factually incorrect. The Federal Reserve can do nothing to get gas and food prices down. I have not read a single article about inflation where they talk to real people, not just economists, and every single time someone mentions gas or food. So to me, and, and you know, I push hard on the administration to do more, but frankly, Congress is the one that has got a whole set of tools and they are doing nothing and no one frankly, I don't think enough people are pointing a finger at them to say, get going. Um, you know, I just, it's because the, the Fed has one tool. It, it can move interest rates around, right? That, that's it. That is not a, it's not a strong tool. It's not a well-targeted, like it's not going to deal with the shipping containers versus the gas company. It just, it pushes everything. Right, um, maybe particularly in the housing market, but in general, it just and they can't. It's not like it has a dial and you can fine tune it. Congress or the administration can do policies that are very targeted to the places where inflation is the worst. We do not have a lump of inflation. We have different sectors and prices. So I think the Fed is committed to do the best they can. The Fed is disagrees fundamentally with the idea that we have to have a severe recession to get inflation down, but they could overdo it, right? Like that's, 
That's entire, and, and that risk is higher and higher the more that they have to go it alone. Mm -hmm. So if not, so the, the Fed is not the secret sauce, the Fed is not the solution. So it sounds like Congress can act, corporations can act, more regulation generally. I do want to actually read another question from the Q&A. Um, which is related. And Rakeen, I'll, I'll toss this question to you. This person said, I'm nodding furiously in response to artificial prices and corrections in the market. I feel like companies hide behind inflation and rising prices in response to any shock to the market as an opportunity to make a quick buck. How do we get out of this cycle? I think this is you know, related to the solutions question we asked earlier, but this person is asking, is it more of a messaging problem and a policy issue? Is there more maybe even education that we can do for consumers? So we know when we're getting price gouged by corporations? I, I mean, I don't wanna put this on consumers. Consumers are having it hard enough right now, right? They're paying higher prices at the pump. They're paying higher prices at the grocery store. They're maybe losing their job or struggling to, to put food on the table. I just, I think this, at the end of the day, um, what we have in this, in our economy is a real power imbalance where mega corporations hold an immense amount of power, especially relative to consumers, to workers, to families, to small businesses. And it is incumbent on the government to regulate them, right? It is incumbent on the government to tackle excess profits. It's incumbent on the government to crack down on price gouging. It's incumbent on the government to make sure that they are, um, you know, corporations are just generally taxed appropriately, that we're addressing the shareholder greed that has gotten us into this, into this point in the first place and to invest in a system that actually works. And so, you know, I'm really sort of resistant to the idea that this should be on consumers. I think it's always helpful for consumers to know what's going on. Um, and I think, you know, the real responsibility is um, on the public sector to take on the excess corporate power that we have in our economy that is driving a, a lot of the problems that we're seeing right now. Mm -hmm. So to help connect the dots, it, it you're right, uh, I and I agree with you, it shouldn't fall on the consumers, but we all want to know what to look out for, what the future holds for us. So I will ask this question to each of you, um, maybe Michael, starting with you, what is your outlook for inflation and impact to consumer wallets in the coming months? What, what do you think we should be expecting? So despite being the ProPublica reporter, um, I actually have some optimism here. Um, and um, and I'll, I'll caveat it though at the end, uh, so, so not to disappoint you, but um, we are seeing some moderation in the supply chain. You know, the, the, the shutdowns in Shanghai really did a lot to allow congestion to, 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 to be eased and to allow prices to fall. So the $20,000 figure that we were seeing last year is now $7,500. That is still three or four times more than what companies were paying before the pandemic. But it's obviously less than the twenty thousand. You know, it's obviously less than that twenty thousand dollars figure. Um, at the same time, um, you know, there there is sort of the signal that demand is shifting back to a, a hopefully a more normal um, balance between services and goods, if not even being muted on both sides. Uh, so that could have a lot. That could do a lot to minimize the supply chain's effect on inflation. Um, what the what sort of the um, red flags are, or sort of the unknown unknowns right now, is um, July first the 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 labor contract uh, on the ports of Los Angeles and uh, Long Beach expired. Uh, you know, so there's a, there's a potential for work slowdowns, there's a potential for strikes, there's a potential that that could kind of slow things down. And we're also kind of heading into this season of when companies start bringing over stuff for back to school and for the holiday season. And we don't know what's gonna happen. We are far more congested than we were before the pandemic uh, at our ports and in our, in, in our supply chains. So are we gonna see a complete return to what we had last year or are we in a better shape? I think it's still at least a month before we know where we are with that. Great, Claudia, any? <laughs> words on what consumers can expect? Yeah, so I guess the first thing I'd underscore is, you know, we talk about inflation. In inflation is an increase in prices, right? Like what we pay, and a lot of people don't get big raises and all that. So I, I don't wanna give any hope or, you know, confidence that the prices are going to come down, right? We've had a lot of inflation, prices have risen a lot. This is, you know, 
inflation coming down doesn't mean prices are coming down, right? So there's still the, the strain on the budget that people are experiencing now, that's probably going to be with us. Um, I do think that, and we've already seen signs that outside of food and gas, that inflation has been stepping down. Like if you look on a monthly basis, not like comparing across a year, the pace has slowed pretty notably relative to last year. Now that's not good enough. I mean, this is why the Fed is continuing to raise interest rates. We're still above where we were before, but there are signs of improvement, but we had signs of improvement last summer. I mean, this is why the Fed was, you know, transitory inflation for several months last summer, inflation month over month stepped down and then Delta came and then Omicron came. So it's, you know, we are in no way ready to take a victory lap or to be confident that things are getting better, but at least the signs since probably about February this year are, are more encouraging. But again, if a lot of the pain is coming from food and gas, that's not the case. And housing is, is still a huge problem, which has, I mean, that's really, a, again, one of these problems. It's a problem that we had before. We didn't have enough affordable housing as it turns out, what they talk about house prices or rent prices are cyclical. Uh, that's economists talk for uh, when the economy is good, rents go up. We had a really strong labor market recovery and it's incredibly sad that we're getting, people, renters are getting punished for that. Like they finally move out, start a family and we have had a chronic undersupply of housing. So again, that's not, that's a bigger problem that goes beyond this, but that's those three things are really important to people, and I don't see relief coming on those soon. Rakeen? Yeah, I mean, I think I've learned my lesson over the course of the last year to not make predictions, as, as Claudia is <laughs> saying. They're never going to be right. Um, but but I did want to pick up on, on a point that Claudia lifted up, which is, you know, we talk about inflation sometimes like it's this abstract thing that's just sort of happening and it doesn't really affect people, except maybe it affects their gas prices. But we care about inflation because we care about people's economic security, right? We care about people's ability to live a good life, a life of dignity. Um, and so while I will not predict what's going to come with prices and inflation, because I think a lot of that depends on the steps we take as a, as, you know, a monetary policy side and on the fiscal policy side, I do think that we also need to be looking at the other side of things, which is how do we make life more affordable for people, right? I mean, to the housing point, we can, this is a long, this is a long game, but like we can invest in more housing supply. Like that is fundamentally one of the core problems that we have right now for housing and the, the price of housing, right? We can, you know, strengthen the ability for people to join a union and to be able to bargain more effectively at work and get higher wages. We can make sure that people have access to affordable, um, uh, affordable and a robust childcare system, right? So there are lots of things that we can do to make people's lives easier. And I think when we look at inflation sort of in isolation, we sort of miss the point of why we care about inflation in the first place, because, you know, at, at Groundwork, we often say we are the economy. It's the idea that when people do well, when families do well, that's when the economy does well. And I think that's really the needs to be the driving principle as we think holistically about the crisis that we're in. All right. Thank you all for that really helpful context. We don't have to make predictions, but now we know what we need to collectively work on as a country and society. So I do wanna turn now more officially to audience Q&A. We've got a bunch of really smart questions submitted even before the, the panel started. So Rakeen, starting with you, back to this idea of these ocean carriers, which have consolidated from hundreds to a small handful today. Bigger picture, what can a free market do to counter the monopolistic power and curb price gouging? And this is from a transportation consultant, this question. Um, well, thanks for the question. And I'm also going to give it off to Michael because I'm sure he has thoughts here too. But, you know, my response to this is we don't live in a free market, right? We live in a market that is fundamentally shaped by and for these big companies. Um, the ocean carrier example is kind of the, the perfect example in many ways. And, and, you know, I think just to repeat what I said earlier, I think that's why we really need to look at the range of tools that we have in our toolbox to start to rebalance those power dynamics. Um, including by addressing the rampant corporate consolidation that's endemic in our economy and increasing competition, but then also making those big investments, you know, empowering our regulators, um, taxing more effectively. So, um, you know, I, I, I think I just, I sort of reject the premise of the question to some degree, but I'll see if maybe Michael has a more insightful thought here. 
Yeah, I think one thing that's that's really been interesting to me is that even as recently as this week, the Biden administration has talked about um, the the you know monopolistic practices of of ocean carriers, um, but the the federal government's regulator for ocean shipping, which is the Federal Maritime Commission, studied this and they came to the conclusion that the those increases that we talked about the two thousand to twenty thousand uh, dollar spikes that we saw were due to demand and to the supply disruptions um, and were not due to anti competitive behavior. Um, that sort of you know the, the own agency of the federal government is obviously it's not. It, it's kind of officially not the Biden administration is independent, um, but that goes against sort of the, the talking points that the White House has used, and they've referred a lot to the Ocean Shipping Reform Act, which is an example of legislation, the sort of narrow legislation that Congress has approved that does help the Federal Maritime Commission have more teeth, but it doesn't, it also, it, it doesn't directly address anything to do with those prices. It doesn't directly address any of the consolidation that we've seen. And the White House uh, and the sponsors of, of the bills in Congress really haven't wrestled with, with this conclusion. Um, and so I'm not quite sure what the game plan is of the White House or Congress to, to deal with that. So relatedly, um, there's a question about the Biden administration. Before I ask it, just a reminder to our audience that you all can ask more questions with the Q&A function if you just click it at the bottom of your screen. Um, so. This question, again, related to the Biden administration, any of you guys can take it. The question is, if the Fed does not have an appropriate tool, and since counting on congressional action seems rather widely optimistic, what do the panelists, what do you all think about the Biden administration's ability to act through international cooperation? And we can also broaden it, broaden it out to any, any other tools that the administration has as well. Right, well, the... Rakina mentioned how problematic our reliance on the global energy, global oil market is. The, we need more supply, right? Like that will help bring prices down. Uh, Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, Iran. Uh, I mean, like the people who have, the countries that have supply, it's problematic, right? Both in terms of, I mean, OPEC still is not up to their pre-pandemic production. Right. So this isn't just about United States producers holding back on supply. This is also globally. So and it appears that the administration has put in an effort, in particular with Saudi Arabia. Uh, this is an uncomfortable place to be, like in terms of international cooperation. Um, I do think one thing that I'm surprised the administration has gone back and forth on the United States and, and Europe, we put an embargo on ourselves, right? Like this is very much the opposite of the 1970s. OPEC had an embargo, prices went up, but in support of Ukraine and to, to punish and try to, uh, you know, have, make it harder for Putin to fight this war, we have limit, Russia is the second largest oil producer, right? So we made our international cooperation is, I mean, on a geopolitical front has had ramifications on an economic front. This, I mean, like we are participating, helping support a war, right? So it is really complicated and our options of international cooperation to get more supply are really problematic. So all of this underscores that if we can't fix it right now, we ought to be, Congress ought to be working really hard to create energy, like really solid energy proposals and legislation that keep us out of this again, so that we are not trying to deal with dictators to reduce hardship at home. Mm -hmm. um, I'll move on to the next question. Um, Rakeen, you had said before that the onus should not be on consumers, but many of us do want to just be smarter consumers. So any of you again can take this question, but this audience question is, how do you distinguish between profits based on supply and demand versus ripoffs or price gouging? How can we just be smarter when we're choosing who to purchase from? It's really hard, right? Because, and I think like the, some of the worst offenders of price gouging and profiteering are big companies that sell essentials, right? So they have, 
market power in, you know, in loads of ways, right? They have market power because they're big. They have market power probably through their supply chain and they sell price and elastic goods, which means that people's demand is not particularly responsive to price. So say you're a parent with, you know, two kids under two, many of my friends are in this situation. You need a diaper, you need a diaper, right? Like it doesn't really matter if a box of diapers is $50 or $75 or $100 if you have to put a diaper on your baby. And so, you know, I think that's what makes it really hard for a consumer to be discerning because, um, you know, the, the worst offenders are the, are the companies that sell goods that you need and you need them because they are essential to your life, right? And, um, you know, I would love to say like, go shop at your small businesses, which you should do, of course. And small businesses are also bearing the brunt of a lot of the price hikes up the supply chain, right? So take your local bike shop. If the price of steel goes up, which it did, you know, there was a, a, an earnings call where we saw the um, CEO, one of the largest steel producers in the US, you know, really excitedly telling their um, shareholders how they were able to jack up prices. Um, the bikes in your local bike shop are going to just be more expensive because they have to pay more for their input costs. And that's just going to be passed on to you as a consumer. So I think really as a consumer being really aware that there are, uh, you know, that big companies are at the root of a lot of the, the issues that we're seeing. Um, I think the, pro the sad thing is because of both monopoly power and, and market power generally, consumers don't have a lot of choice, right? That's in some ways the definition. Um, so and unfortunately, I don't know how to be a smarter consumer. If someone figures that out, please let me know. Just do your research and attend panels like this as much as you can, at least. So another question for anyone, this cannot be unique to the United States, right? How do we compare it to the rest of the developed countries? If they're having inflation as well, is it less or more than the US, if anyone has context on that? I did want to ask, oh, go ahead, Claudia. And then no, 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 go too. ahead, go ahead. Um, I did want to ask um, this question, I guess, to, to you guys as well, because there was a paper that was put out by one of the Federal Reserve Banks that said that try to look at why is inflation higher in the U.S. than in other developed countries. Um, and what they did was they took out the gas and um, or energy and food prices and found that three percentage points of, of inflation was related to um, the additional stimulus efforts that we made um, through the COVID recovery relief plans. And so I'm curious what you guys think about that. Yeah, so basically I'll be getting to argue questions like this with my peers until the day I die. Um, so it, I read that study and, uh, and there's another study at the San Francisco Fed that says basically the rescue plan caused none of the inflation um, because it's really, it's really hard to do the comparisons. Comparing the United States to Europe is not an apples to apples comparison. Like, I don't care if you just strip out, you know, the food and energy, our housing market is different. Uh, there's a study uh, by the Federal Reserve that almost a third of the, um, the rent inflation is people moving around the United States because of COVID, right? And again, we, didn't, we don't have a house. I mean, first of all, people in Europe don't do that. They tend to stay where they're at. And then we didn't have the housing uh, supply to deal with that. Right. So, and we have different health care. Like, there's so many differences between the two places in terms of how we spend and what, you know, like, so I think it's an extremely hard comparison to do. And that's why you do other comparisons like over time in the US and yada, yada. The thing that I found interesting that's another disruption that's really similar um, is the labor shortages. We have that in the United States and in Europe, they really are struggling to get workers back to. And that that's something that has uh, basically nothing to do with the war in in Ukraine, right? So there are definitely um, similarities in the disruptions, but it's not a perfect lineup. But yes, if you take the data and you pull off food and energy, we have more of what's referred to as kind of the core inflation than Europe does. So, but but I don't. Th that's not. There are a lot of things that are different about the United States than Europe, than just the rescue plan. So that's why that comparison is hard. Mm -hmm. Great context. Um, one last question related to consumers being more educated. What is the most relevant or what are the most relevant economic indicators for everyday consumers? Basically, what should we be paying attention to? 
I can tell you what I always pay attention to, and it's kind of perfectly timed because tomorrow's job day. Um, I think it's always really important to pay attention to how the most marginalized are doing in our economy. That's that's how you really know if things are getting better or getting worse. And so um, focusing on the black unemployment rate is to me like one of the best signals that you can look at to see, you know, are we actually creating an equitable economy? Are we actually closing racial gaps in employment? Um, obviously, employment is not everything. Job quality matters too. Um, labor force participation matters too. But I think really focusing in on um, you know, the employment rates of folks who are tend to be left out of the labor market at the best of times is a really good indicator, a set of indicators to pay attention to. Great. Claudia, Michael, any final thoughts on what we should be paying attention to? Yeah, I guess as a consumer, it's uh, people's experiences are so specific, right, to what they need. So I, I totally agree that understand like what's going on in the labor market or their jobs, um, which I mean, frankly, should be important to most consumers, most families, what the job prospects are. Um, but I find it, I find it really hard to give advice like on this grand scale of what to look at in the economy. And frankly, I don't think looking at the aggregate inflation rate is a particularly good signal of how financially secure a consumer is or you know a community is. I'll speak to um, I'll speak to one that we shouldn't pay attention to, um, and I think that's um, you know the stock market going down. I think we shouldn't be looking at how Wall Street responds to think that that is a reflection of the economy and not confuse that. What they're responding to is what they predict is an end to inflated profits and and free money that we have enjoyed not just for the past two years but for 14 years. You know the Fed has been involved in keeping rates low and buying bonds at, at really historic rates. And then on top of that, you know, there was a huge corporate tax cut uh, that, that provided a, a, a big stimulus for corporations. Um, so I think that is sort of what Wall Street is responding to. And it doesn't necessarily mean that job losses are, are the next step. That is a great warning to end on.